Hello, welcome everyone to our Atheist Day webinar uh, organized by the Atheist Alliance International. We are a nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, we're committed to raising awareness and educating the public about atheism. Uh, the group supports atheist and free thought organizations all over the world. We promote local campaigns, uh, raising awareness uh, of issues related to secularism and education around the world. We have uh, an amazing panel of speakers who will be uh, joining us today. Um, the likes of uh, Nina Sankari, uh, Tony Van Pelt, Tony Sheedy, Amir Schnabel, August Berkshire. Um, and uh, it would it will be uh, host uh, moderated by uh, the amazing Hugo Estrella from Argentina. Um, if you wish to support our work, you can uh, go to our website, um, atheistalliance.org, and all donations are welcome. You can become a member. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, we're on most social media. So I thank you everyone for joining. We've got about 60 participants so far and uh, it's an honor to have you all and i'll pass the mic over to hugo estrada thank you thank you alfonso good morning good atheist day to everybody uh, thanks for being here before we start with the webinar we have an important message coming from Turkey. So I would ask our friend Onur to, to tell us what's going on there and uh, why we have something to celebrate today uh, as atheists around the world. Please, Onur. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Atheist Day webinar. I will try to keep this short. I'm going to talk about the Atheist Refugee Assistance Program, Turkey. Um, the website is atheistrefugeesturkey.com. We call it um, Arab for short. And um, as you may all know, mm -hmm. Turkey in, uh, shelters the greatest number of refugees in the world, now getting close to 10 to 15 million. And um, a few years ago, in the year 2021, um, we got inspired by the Atheist uh, Asylum Project, which is also known as Atheist Support Network of AAI, and also the Secular Rescue Program of CFI. And we wanted to uh, take it um, to the Turkey, where we can um, hopefully help more. So in collaboration with these two organizations and then uh, ex-Muslims of North America who later on joined our forces, uh, we have established this program where we provide five services to atheist refugees who are currently stuck in Turkey, which is a 90% Muslim dominated country. Our services are uh, helping asylum seekers and refugees to find suitable housing or roommates in Turkey um, because it is important to have like-minded people around you uh, for support and also not to be kicked out once they discover that you are an unbeliever. And we help them with uh, job placement, assisting atheist asylum seekers and refugees finding employment opportunities in Turkey, translating refugees, <laughs> looking for uh, job ads. We provide them legal aid by accepting applications um, or uh, not by helping them to submit their ex uh, applications to the immigration uh, office through immigration lawyers. We issue official letters uh, like recommendation support or verification letters to Turkish Immigration Division or other countries' consulates, embassies, or to UNHCR on behalf of the asylum seekers. And for last, we provide guidance in three areas psychological guidance, educational guidance, if they need scholarships or that kind of stuff, or financial guidance, uh, if they need rent support, food support, or any other support. 
these are the five main services we provide. And hopefully next year, um, we will also be uh, opening a um, safe house in Turkey. But before I get into the safe house, I will just uh, talk about what we have done so far. Um, since the beginning of the launch of our program in late 2020, so far we have uh, helped 20 cases for accommodation, 19 cases for employment, 40 cases for legal aid, 59 cases for letters of support, and 74 cases for guidance services. And we have organized 13 workshops. So since uh, we launched our program, I, I can say that we have taken care of over 200 cases. And um, to become a partner of uh, the ATS Refugee Assistance Program, it's um, only $3,000 per year uh, for organizations who would like to join our forces. And uh, for last, I would like to touch, uh, give a little bit um, teaser about what we are going doing uh, next year. We are planning to uh, open and operate a safe house in Turkey, which can shelter up to uh, 16 beds in total uh, for atheist refugees uh, exclusively. Um, and uh, hopefully, we will provide more information and we will be sending emails to your respective organizations soon about uh, this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anur. That's very good news. And um, uh, it's good to know that uh, you are working strongly in the, in the Muslim world for supporting the atheists. Now, back to our to our webinar today. I'm speaking from one of the Vatican colonies. We just have, we have to remember that we are not only dominated by the uh, religious uh, extremists in the, in the Islamic world, but uh, by different re extreme religionists uh, around the world. So um, uh, me, myself, I, I was born in Argentina. I live in Italy, so I move around the Vatican colonies. And um, it's good to be here today, and it's good to have uh, um, AAI putting together this panel to celebrate what's been in the uh, struggle for several decades uh, for secularism uh, in, in the world. Uh, as you see, this panel is uh, composed by a number of young activists uh, from different parts of the world, North, South, East, uh, the Western world. Well, I said I said the purpose, young activists, because we've been we've been around for like thirty years, uh, committed to these uh, purposes and and to these goals of achieving more open and secular societies, and uh, it it was a good idea, I think, and I thank uh, Tonoi from AI uh, to put us together today to see what's happened in, in these decades and, and how did we manage, if we managed, to change something for the better in our uh, society. So I would, uh, this, uh, the, the mechanics of this webinar is going to be that we have uh, first some, uh, a few minutes of uh, opening statements from each of the, of the participants. And then there's going to be uh, a session of questions and answers, which for which we have the the support, the help of uh, David Brand and David Silverman, who are going to uh, act as um, facilitators of the of putting together those those questions we get, and uh, and present them to the panel and for each of the participants. So to start. We, we have the first uh, panelist, August Berkshire, who's been an atheist and activist uh, since 1984, when he, when he founded the uh, modern atheist movement in Minnesota with the Twin Cities chapter of the American Atheists. And in the United States, he has served on the national boards of directors of the American Atheists, 
and the Freedom from Religion Foundation internationally. He was past vice president of the Atheist Alliance International before they split with Atheist Alliance of America. And since uh, last year, he's the vice president of our organization. He's the author of uh, numerous pamphlets and presentations, such as Atheism, A View of the World from the Ground Up, and uh, 27 Reasons God We Live is Dying. He's been speaking and active uh, for this many years. So uh, the floor is yours, dear August. Thank you. Okay, just just a Hello. note bef before before August begins, uh, there is some noise coming from somewhere. So if you if you all please mute your microphones, uh, because uh, someone uh, has uh, pointed this out in the chat. Thanks a lot. Go yeah. on, uh, August. Yeah. And also, I post most of the humorous memes that are on the Atheist Alliance International Facebook page. So anyway, it seems to me that uh, what atheist groups do falls mainly into three categories, community, education, and activism. Community is providing groups and activities for atheists to meet other atheists, and sometimes for non-atheists to visit and meet atheists. Community also includes participating as public atheists in things that benefit the community as a whole, like whole, like the charity walkathons. Uh, education is educating ourselves and the general public about atheism through things like publications, speakers, interviews, letters to the editor, uh, debates, blogs, podcasts, and websites. And activism consists mainly in lobbying legislatures, engaging in protests, and filing court challenges. And in the case of AAI, rescuing endangered atheists, mostly from uh, Muslim countries. And the priority of these three categories, community, education, and activism, tends to be the opposite for local versus national groups. Local groups are better at providing more frequent community events for atheists, while national groups tend to have just one convention every year. Uh, for education, both groups, local and national, are good at it, but they tend to do it differently. Local groups are better at providing speakers to non-atheist groups in the community, uh, like compared to religion classes at schools. And local groups are more likely to get letters to the editor published in uh, local newspapers. And national groups are better at educating through magazines, books, podcasts, websites, uh, billboards, and TV commercials. Uh, when it comes to activism, some local groups don't even engage in it very much because they don't have maybe the resources or to want to focus more on social aspects of the groups. Uh, when local groups do engage in activism, they're better at lobbying city councils and state capitals and national groups and international groups are better at lobbying at the federal level and the United Nations. Um, activism in the form of filing lawsuits is rare for local groups, mainly due to cost and expertise. Um, almost all lawsuits are filed by national groups, although they usually have local atheists as plaintiffs. And uh, another example of atheism, as I mentioned, is AAI rescuing uh, atheists from endangered country, countries where they're endangered. And this is really only possible, uh, I shouldn't say only, but mainly possible with national and international groups. It's, it's very hard for local groups to engage in something on this scale. Uh, many of the things that local, national, and international atheist groups do is being taken over by the internet. If you want the community of fellow atheists, social media can satisfy some of that desire. If you want education on atheism, there are essays, lectures, debates, interviews, and podcasts available for free online. As the philosopher Daniel Dennett said nine years ago, um, it takes 20 years to grow a, ba a Baptist and 20 minutes to lose one. And indeed, people are becoming atheists at younger ages now than in the past. However, the one thing that even artificial intelligence cannot replace is actual boots on the ground activism. 
And this is what Atheist Alliance does best with our Atheist Support Network. Um, we're also doing what we can to help stand up to blasphemy laws, which shockingly, after some years of progress in this area, are being passed even in some Western countries. So uh, in closing, I think Atheist Support Network is our greatest contribution that AI is making, not just to our fellow atheists, but to humanity as a whole. Thanks. Thank you very much, dear August. Now our second uh, panelist uh, comes from Israel, and it is Amir Schnabel. He works in the high-tech industry and is a secular activist, as well as the president of the Israeli Atheist Association. He's a member of the high-tech protest movement's leadership that advocates for freedom and democracy. You know, Israel has been undergoing a long struggle for freedom and democracy under the extreme right-wing government of today. Amir's insights have been sought by prominent Israeli media outlets such as Haaretz, Times of Israel, and Democrat TV. We are very proud of having Amir on board, and uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Amir. Well, thank you all very much for uh, letting, letting me speak. I wanted to start with saying that I came from the most boring country, but the only thing I can say I wish it was. So many things are going on in here. It's quite uh, hard to follow, even uh, for myself as an Israeli sometimes. What I would like uh, to use as my moments of speaking is to give you an overview of whatever is going on over here. I think it's interesting. I will try to stay away from the very immediate things that are going on and try to talk more about the, the aftermath of the, of the result of what's happening here. And I try to do that by discussing the different groups, social groups, we've seen Israel and try to discuss uh, what are the trends that I can see that will have some effect on the future. I, so before I, I'm going in, just a small uh, note, I'm doing a lot of generalization and uh, someone that really advocate against generalization, it's very difficult for me uh, to stay, uh, but uh, talking about for five to eight minutes doesn't let me the time uh, to go into details about different aspects of some of my generalization. So I ask for your forgis forgiveness before I'm starting. Okay, let's go. So let's say uh, start uh, overview. So before, I'm, before I delve into analyzing the social groups, I, I would like to give a brief overview of the social groups in Israel. We have, of course, the major division of Arabs and Jews. When we can see very interesting trends in the Arab society, we see that the Arabs mostly did not interfere, the Israeli Arabs I'm talking, did not interfere with what's going on. We saw many Arabs that are, uh, I wouldn't say lining, but they feel uh, doesn't feel the need to go against uh, Israel at the moment at all. We see Arab parties within uh, the the last coalition or the current coalition. And we saw Arabs uh, risking their life either in saving uh, Jews and others in, in in the stuff that happened. And we see even Arabs that are being uh, kidnapped at the moment. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting. I don't know where it's going on, but if I'm talking about trends, I would like to say that the most important thing that I see is Arabs that are want to join the, uh, the Israel co uh, government coalition, like in the last government. 
and they are working more about uh, cooperating and not uh, being in conflict. And this is very interesting, and I, I guess that's uh, the end that I'm going to talk about the Arabs. This is not my specialty, Arabs. <laughs> okay, we'll go on. Uh, the Jews, which are the majority, of course, in Israel, we are about 80% of the population. We have four major groups that we should uh, look at uh, when you are we're analyzing the society. We've got the seculars, which are mostly liberals. We have a, a huge amount of people that are being called the observants. There is the National Religious Party that I'm going to talk about, a lot of them, and we've got the ultra-orthodox people that you can recognize them by wearing the black clothes. And those are uh, the very extreme in religious, uh, less extreme, extreme when you talk about state uh, issues. I try to explain what has happened within each group. And please note, I'm not a prophet, so I will present in facts and observation. And I don't know what will happen in, in the future because things can change. And as uh, you probably are following, sometimes things are changing very fast in matter of hours, something going from one side to the other. Let's start with the liberals, which uh, that's ours, that's me. And this is the, I think it's the most interesting group today in the Israel society and in the future. So it was a very challenging year for the liberal forces. Uh, the liberals began to organize and become active in January 4, 2023. That was when uh, the government decided to put up uh, the judicial overall decision. Would practice, if it would have passed, it would dismantle the democracy in Israel. Nothing less than that. They wanted full control of the judicial system. They wanted full control on the media and on education. They just wanted it all. So we went to the street on uh, January 4th and I am I, I'm very pleased that I'm uh, part of this uh, protest. It, it appeared until then that the liberal was very, uh, were very silent, sitting on the fence, said that everything will be okay, we don't need to do anything, we don't need to fight anything. And suddenly you see a big burst of outrage. People just got out of the street every Saturday I, at 7 p.m., like uh, you call for duty. We, we've been uh, hundreds and thousands of people on the street all over the country. And I, I have to say that we actually won because uh, the judicial overall, uh, stop. Was, it's completely halted right now. Even when they tried a few weeks ago to pass uh, one of the laws that was, that was part of it, it was being thrown to the garbage can. So we were very strong. But then October 7 came. So of course everything changed from one force to the other. The liberal forces I decided uh, to put uh, to stand on the fence, not to, to be involved. Uh, the liberal forces were uh, joined together to help in civil duties, helping uh, the people that were hurt by the condition. And that's what happened. But then a few, about a month ago, due to some bunch of Israelis law that are, need to be passed according to desire of the Supreme Court, actually, suddenly you saw that the liberals are coming out and instead of just calling to work against uh, the government, because they, it's true most of the protests nowadays, even the one I'm going right after this meeting, is a calling for a new election and to overthrow the right-wing government. But as I started to say, 
that's not is it's not the only issue. Another very interesting issue that concerning us is that the religious aspects going against religious law again against religious infiltration inside uh, secular uh, neighborhoods and cities became very strong in the protest. People, uh, the liberal are saying, uh, it's not that only the democracy that we want, we want our rights, our right to be seculars and to stay that way. And, and you see it much more stronger nowadays than you saw it before uh, the October 7th uh, appearance. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to avoid in the a world, uh, so I'm getting confused sometimes. Anyhow, uh, let's go. Uh, we had an election in, on uh, February 27th, an uh, election for the municipality. The liberal forces gained strength in very large cities and many small cities. The liberals became very strong. Uh, we can see now that some co uh, coalition papers and agreements are uh, coming out. And when you look over like uh, the coalition agreement between the liberals and the mayor in Tel Aviv, you can first see a very strong advocation of liberal values in the city, which, for example, are uh, public transportation, limiting the religious uh, infiltration inside the neighborhoods. It's something very strong in Israel, allowing uh, the, a, a light train uh, to travel in uh, also on the Sabbath day, and all, all bunch uh, and, uh, more control about religious in schools, which is really a problem that uh, need to be addressed uh, to limit the infiltration of the school everywhere. So this is very strong and it happens. Uh, so I'm talking about the agreement in Tel Aviv, which I'm more aware of, but the same will go on in 26 more cities around the country because uh, the liberal became so strong power. So this is something to look forward. I think it will be very a lot of implication in the future. I move to talk about a different group, which is very interesting, and which is a, I call it the observant group. The people are those are people that are, you know, they, they sometimes they go to the synagogue, sometimes they don't, sometimes they go to the synagogue, and the day after they will break any law possible by uh, lighting cigarette or going clubbing or whatever. Uh, so they are very light religious people. I can't say that they are uh, any right wing or right wing because they are very diverse. They are, you have all, uh, all different kinds of uh, political view within, the, within them and also it's a large range of uh, the way they accept and practice religion. They do it very, very lightly. I like to talk about them because they are really an example of what's going on in Israel. I always say that the Israel government or the Israel state is playing like a tango with religion. We're doing some when it's convenient, we talk about, they talk about uh, the religions and how we should unite the, uh, for our uh, culture to be more religious. And sometimes we just uh, throw them away. For example, like uh, the religious are against, of course, uh, the same sex uh, relationship, offender, but the state is accepting it. And uh, religious and uh, couples in Israel are full, almost 99% uh, full rights uh, nowadays. So the, the government is kind of playing, a, I call it a tango. Sometimes it's religious, sometimes it's not. Whenever it's convenient, whenever they can sell it. And uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, the way the observant group is feeling. And if uh, I'm going back to political view, there are also people who can move from one side to the other, uh, political-wise, from the right wing to the left wing. But there are many of them. 
Okay, so let's keep those. And I want to talk about the ultra-religious. Uh, as I said, uh, for people who doesn't know, the ultra-religious people are the ones that were in black clothes. If it was up to them, they would like to have, to have that Israel will disappear as a secular entity. Uh, the idea of having an Israel state is against their belief. So they, don't, they really don't care about what's going on in Israel in terms of uh, political issues. The only thing they care is that how they can exist within Israel. So those people, most of them, usually, uh, are not willing to be drafted. They're not going to the army. They try not to pay taxes whenever they can. Uh, men are not working, women are working, and also raising children, and taking care of the house, and doing just everything. And what they really care about is that uh, they have um, funding from the government, as much funding as they can get, and they do it by using their political power, mostly. And, and the other thing is that they'll be able to be separated. So they don't want to, they don't want to get involved in the secular life in Israel because they are afraid and I don't blame them to be afraid that if their people will go to be to work in secular company, to go to the army where it's 90% seculars, the people will become seculars and not religious. And the authority of the, the controlling rabbis will diminish. And that's the major problem. But then let's talk again about the October 7, because again, the October 7 put aside what is happening uh, in the war in, inside Israel. It, it just, it, it's amazing because many of those ultra-religious youngsters began starting to talk about uh, going to the army to be drafted. They are willing to do it. They're still waiting for the rabbis to allow them but they are talking about it. They are more open. You can see many ultra-religious uh, youngsters and a bit more are joining relief efforts, whether it's uh, health uh, cares, uh, providing uh, food to the refugees and stuff like that. Uh, they were involved in the most gruesome work of uh, recognizing uh, the burned bodies, something that I don't, I'm not sure seculars were. Uh, Thank you very much, Amir. I think, I think we should uh, continue with this after, Sorry. with the question and answers uh, uh, section. Is it okay, possible? Sorry. It's okay with you? Okay. It's okay, I'm sorry for that one. No, it, it was okay. Thank you so much. Now, um, I'm very interesting because it's very touching for all of us. Um, my dear old friend, Toni van Pelt, is the next speaker. She is a dedicated feminist activist and recognized for her tireless advocacy in the fight for gender equality and reproductive justice. As uh, the former president of the National Organization of, for Women, she spearheaded initiatives addressing discrimination, healthcare access, and violence against women. Tony's leadership uh, emphasized intersectionality, ensuring marginalized voices were heard within the feminist movements. Tony is co founder, president, and public policy director for the Institute for Science and Human Values. This was uh, founded by, by our dear. Paul Kurtz, I remember Paul Kurtz, and uh, she is the former vice president and public policy director of the Center for Inquiry, where we first met. And uh, I am very happy to pass on the floor now to her. Thank you. Welcome, Tony. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have been invited. We've been asked to talk about the progress and future of atheism and also the present day situation in our locality. I live in Florida in the United States. 
We are suffering an expected backlash from Christian nationalists and white supremacy groups here in the States. I call them the fear lobby. It feels overwhelming, yet we must realize that it is not as severe as it has been in the past. We must proudly stand and take credit for the work that we've been doing. More are identifying with our movement out loud. It used to be an overwhelming majority of Americans felt that they must be seen as Christian or Catholic to be safe in their homes or communities. That number has decreased as each year passes. The religious have become more strident, demanding, threatening, and acting out violently here. Chaplains in public schools instead of counselors, the national prayer breakfast being served in the statuary hall in the Capitol building, guns allowed in most places, of course not in legislatures or the federal buildings. Stand your ground laws are being passed and used successfully to getting away with killing others. This is who they are. According to the 2023 Pew poll, 4% of U.S. adults identify as atheist. This is up from 3% in 2014 and 2% in 2007. The majority are white males and have a college degree. Roughly 8 in 10 atheists identify with or lean toward the Democratic Party. 72% of religiously unaffiliated adults, those who identify as atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular, say conservative Christians have gone too far in trying to control religion in government and public schools here. Of course, 63% of Christians say the same thing about secular liberals. We know organized religion is a threat to democracy and its core value of equality. The good news is, as a whole, Americans, regardless of how they identify, do not believe that the U.S. is or should be a Christian nation. In the last 50 years, this enlightened thinking has allowed the inclusion of values and the value of women, Jews, the LGBTQIA plus community, the disability community, people of color, and the environmental community to advance something we've really never experienced before in the U.S. Organized religion is used to drive Christian nationalist and white supremacy policies via politics. In the good news column, for the first time in 2016, the majority of American citizens voted for a woman, Hillary Clinton, to be president. The bad news is the Electoral College, which was set up by the founders of the country to protect rich, Land-owning white men overrode the popular vote. The good news is churches are being abandoned, sold, repurposed, some as living spaces. Why? Because they're empty. Supporting white male-dominated pulpits have gone out of fashion these days. We know better than most how most folks are now unchurched. Christian nationalism is losing steam here. In the U.S., evangelical Christians were instrumental in voting Trump into office in 2016. His use of organized Christianity is well known. He's declared himself a god. Following in Trump's footsteps in his run for his second term as the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis likened himself to a prophet sent by God to, quote, take the arrows. He claimed in a campaign ad that on Quote, the eighth day of creation, God needed a protector, so God made a fighter. That fighter is none other than DeSantis himself. He pushed through a law that still bans explicit classroom curriculum about LGBTQIA plus topics. The good news is the vague language of the law was challenged, gutting large parts and clarifying it in a settlement with civil rights attorneys who challenged it. The bad news is it currently outlaws instruction about gender identity and sexuality in a classroom, in a book, or even in a unit in a section of a textbook. Sociology is no longer being taught because it talks about human sexuality. AP African American history is out because there's a queer theory unit that must not be discussed or recognized. 
The good news is folks can openly discuss gender identity and sexuality in the classroom in discussions and essays and projects. Many of you know that Florida started banning books, safe spaces, stickers and locations, and LGBTQ plus clubs at school. The good news, these are all now legal due to the settlement. Florida still doesn't have comprehensive sex education or an end to the school voucher debacle. And to make matters worse, school prayer has been reintroduced. Religious folks work to end, and this is hard for me to say, recreational sex, the use of birth control and abortion. They don't care if women have pleasure, if they have happiness, if they decide their own fate or if they die. In the Christian nationalist world, women's lives are not of value. At least 250 million tax dollars are being used to fund fake crisis pregnancy centers in the next two years in Florida. Generally, the staff has no medical training and they're not licensed. They lie to women and they do all in their power to keep them from accessing affordable, safe abortion. The good news is, it's a secular value to support women in their decision as to whether or not they will carry a pregnancy to term. We work to make this a reality. Buffer zones around clinics were legalized to lessen the impact of Christian nationalists screaming and yelling at them as they entered the clinics for their procedures. More good news is the, the conservative Florida Supreme Court has allowed a Florida amendment, the right to abortion initiative to be voted on in the November elections. Other states have done the same thing. The conservative states, Ohio, Kentucky, and Kansas have enshrined abortion rights in their constitutions. The executive director of every library believes there are three factors driving the current banning and censorship campaigns around the country. One is that political actors are looking to signal to their base that they are doing something with a new agenda identifying new supporters, and building up their own credibility among their political base. They're utilizing the book challenge approach to advance other agendas, whether they are anti-union, anti-public se sector workforce, or anti-tax. And finally, there is parental control and concern, a moralistic agenda attached to it as well. According to his line of reasoning, if book banners can criminalize the content, they accomplish two things. First, they can criminalize the humans that the books represent, and second, they can make it illegal to teach it. Thus, they criminalize the moral issue they oppose, like gender studies or sex ed. As Rachel Laser, president of Americans United asserts, quote, if your claim is you will be harmed unless you can harm someone else, then you are really looking for a government to favor you, not for equality, the premise of our democracy. Secular democracy continues to be favored by the majority of American citizens. We see that more Americans are identifying as atheist and or non-religious. We are headed in the right direction. What's key for the future is that we persist and we persevere in our work. Remember, when we take action, we win. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Tony, very much. That was very enlightening on, on the situation uh, and very troublesome as well, but uh, there's way to go. Thank you so much. Um, I, I remember the audience that uh, after this section we're going to have a question and answers um, chance so you can um, start uh, sending your, your questions in written so we can work them afterwards. Um, the next participant coming directly from the Houses of Parliament, as you will see, is uh, John Richards. John Richards is a retired science teacher and politician who has turned into an atheist activist. He served on the board of the Atheist Alliance International and is currently the president of Atheism UK. 
He hosts a Free Thought Hour, a YouTube show dedicated to the atheist cause. He is a former editor of the Secular World magazine, organizes public events in conjunction with the Origins Project. Recent initiatives include commissioning a statue to celebrate the attaining of a majority of non-believers in the UK. So we are very happy to have John here. And John, the floor is yours. Unmute. Yes. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. This is wonderful. Who was it said that getting atheists together is like herding sheep? I mean, that's ridiculous. There's over 70 of us here from all over the world. And this is a tribute to AAI for organizing such a wonderful event. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch on the uh, success that atheism is having in the UK, because I'm not really here. You know, I could be anywhere. It's a green screen. <laughs> so I could be up a tree in the Philippines if I had that picture. But what we've got in the UK is a trend and it's away from theism. And whether you look at the census results over the past, I don't know, 80 years or the British Social Attitude Survey polls, the trend is firmly in the Christianity collapsing, none of the other religions gaining much, but nones, you know, N-O-N-E-S's rising steadily and it depends where you look but in some places we're a majority now we've got to we've got to do something we do you know when atheist day was initiated in the 60s it made a ripple in the ocean of culture like dropping a sand grain into the atlantic ocean we've got to make a bigger impact and as um, our host kindly said, I'm hoping that we've got something that we can gather around because inspired by the, the horrible Muslim statue that they are trying to put up in uh, Bradfordistan in the Midlands of the UK, which is called Strength of the Hijab. And it's a... I think it's a one ton heap, 10 foot high of rusty steel, depicting a very angular female head in a scarf. You know, I don't know who they use for the model, but she would be insulted in, in the appearance of it. So th that's the inspiration. Now, my proposal is that we should gather around a statue to celebrate the progress of atheism. And the, here's the idea. It's a mannequin, you know, a puppet. The strings go up to a cloud where a hand is coming out and the strings are attached to the fingers. It's God's hand. And coming along to cut the strings is a pair of scissors. Okay, now the title for this statue is Break Free, exclamation mark. And the audio aspect of it comes from Queen's worldwide hit, I Want to Break Free. And I'm hoping to get Sir Brian May the guitarist from Queen, any other surviving members, or perhaps Ben Elton, who wrote the Queen musical, We Will Rock You, to unveil this statue. And at the moment, I'm looking for erecting it in Red Lion Square, London, at central London, which is the, the home of the Ethical Society where Conway Hall is. I know many of you know that venue. And I'd like to say hello to some of my old friends that I see here, some of my former victims in, in the guest slot of Free Thought Hour. And by the way, tonight we have we feature Rob Palmer in Free Thought Hour. Uh, some of you may know him. He writes for Skeptical Inquirer. He's one of the guerrilla skepticism editors on Wikipedia, and he's a volunteer for recovering from religion. So watch that show. It's on later in about, what, um, four hours? 
no, a bit, a bit longer, five, five and a bit hours. And you can see that on Free Thought Productions YouTube channel. I also do, by the way, Global Atheist News, a weekly roundup of the way religion has impacted humanity in the previous seven days. And it's so ridiculous very often and horrifying on other occasions. So please watch my shows. I do need to have a bigger audience. But, you know, we could unite around this statue. We could, somebody in the chat here has said, we want to form a big tent. Here it is. We can all have little effigies of this statue on our mantelpieces. We can all have mounted uh, versions of the original sketch. And do you know who's doing the statue? Internationally renowned Andrew Sinclair sculptor who's already got a number of statues in city centers around the world. Who wants a copy of the original sketch? At our first event that um, Lawrence and I are organizing, hello Lawrence, thanks for coming, <laughs> in May in London, in Chinatown, in fact in London, Andrew will be there signing a copy, and maybe the original, of his first, you know, back of the envelope drawing, his design for this statue. This is something, let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very interesting and, uh, and appealing. <laughs> now the, the next uh, part, Participant, the president and founder of Atheists for Liberty. His insights have been sought by prominent media outlets like Vanity Fair, and his name has been referenced on platforms such as the Joe Rogan Experience. Through numerous appearances on shows, blogs, and podcasts, Shidi has solidified his position as a leading advocate for atheist activism. Drawing from his background in public policy, he specializes in the burgeoning demographic of atheism and staunchly supports the separation of religion and government, as well as religious freedom. So thank you very much for being here, for joining us. And Thomas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, AAI, for having me. Uh, my earbuds here might die out, and if so, I'm going to switch the speaker. So wouldn't be surprised if there was a bit of a pause. but. Thank you so much for AI for, for hosting this webinar. I see so many people that are in the chat. Uh, we got three full pages of participants from around the world. I've been a part of the uh, advisory council, I know, for quite some time, but quite inactive on there. Hopefully going to uh, change that very, very soon. So I want to get into an interesting topic that was proposed for me to talk about. Um, atheism on the right in American politics. Um, granted, I'll just state for the record, Atheists for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're not a left-wing organization. We're not a right-wing organization. We're an atheist organization. But one of the things we do, unlike plenty of our counterparts in this country, is we reach out to other parts of the American politic that other atheist groups don't do. So I want to bring you all back in time. We're celebrating 30 years here of atheist advocacy from Atheist Alliance International, and plenty a lot of your activism resonates with what's been happening in the United States over the last 20 years. I want to talk to you all about a man named Woody Kaplan. Woody Kaplan was one of the former heads of the ACLU, staunch civil rights advocate, a free speech supporter and advocate for separation between church and state. 22 years ago, him and other activists proposed the creation of an event called the Godless Americans March on Washington, also known as the Gamow getting a bunch of atheists that weren't even that popular yet to scourge up resources to, to have some kind of presence at the Washington Mall. And in 2002, him and a bunch of other atheists, around 2,000 of them, um, made their appearance, made their debut. And while the crowd size was not that big yet, and while atheism wasn't getting as normalized yet, they created a new movement. Um, a secular coalition for America that ended up birthing lobbying groups, PACs, and other entities that ultimately led to some amazing successes on the left in American politics. Um, because during this particular event, 
Oh, that's where the earbuds came out. One second here. Speaker, we're going to go to this. Because it doesn't matter uh, at the end of the day, and this is one of Woody's vision, it didn't matter what side you were on in American politics. The, mat the, the main concept was if you were an atheist that supported the idea of normalizing atheism, preserving free thinking and safeguarding secularism and defending our liberties as atheists, you were included in this new, rich, small in 2002, but growing movement. It was then due to the successes of the Four Horsemen, numerous other nonprofits, the birth of atheism on the internet, people like David Silverman and Lawrence Krauss coming out with ever popular books, that atheism became a massive phenomenon. And in 2012, 10 years later, you had this event called the Reason Rally. And tomorrow is actually going to be the 12 year anniversary of that event, the successor to the Gamma, where unlike 2000 old atheists trying to get everything together under Woody's vision, 30,000 atheists showed up in the rain and in the cold. That was the success of atheist movement, unity and bipartisanship. So it was through all this collective work that on the left and in the Democratic Party in American politics, you ended up seeing something called the creation of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, where numerous members now of the U.S. House of Representatives proudly support the rights of atheists and agnostics, science advocacy, and more. Great stuff. Where in 2002, you couldn't even get a single state Democrat to acknowledge atheist rights whatsoever. And Woody was very pleased by that. A lot of the people in 2002 that ended up seeing that vision become su became successful, they were very pleased by that too. But there was a bit of a problem that happened a few years after that first rally, our movement's division. In the United States, I'm not going to call out any specific groups, any specific individuals here, plenty of groups and individuals started to prioritize outside politics. You had plenty of atheist groups that used to work with Woody quite a bit, prioritize social justice instead of atheism. A lot of atheist entities instead became social justice entities. And our original mission, our nonpartisan mission to normalize atheism in the country and to stand up for our rights became sidetracked. Innocent people got canceled. We divided each other over nonsensical issues. When if you wanted to support an outside issue, you could have supported a think tank that had millions of dollars more than the small amount of resources that we had in the atheist community. And now some of us don't even talk to each other. Look in this chat and see how we divide ourselves over these very outside issues. And now with the first ever Republican, conservative Republican state senator in Idaho being an outed atheist, literally What's happened on the left now starting to happen on the right, our 2002 moment happening now. Where's the support from all those other entities that used to back Woody? It's non-existent. So five years ago, myself and other veterans from the left and the right from the atheist community came together and founded a national organization called Atheists for Liberty. And one of the things that we ended up doing is copying what the successful organizations did in the past. They reached out to the left. We're going to go ahead, too, and reach out to the right. You're going to have atheist organizations that go to Netroots Nation. We're going to go to the Conservative Political Action Conference and find all the atheists and agnostics that are there. We're going to go to the libertarian events, such as Freedom Fest and Liberty Con, and get them all to band together to do exactly what we did those 20 years ago. And we're not going to let outside politics divide us and corrode us as a result of this. So... We have Joffrey Schroeder, state senator in Idaho, who is an outed conservative atheist. That trend is only going to continue. And it's going to be an interesting question that all of you are going to ask yourselves. Are we going to unite like we did 22 years ago, despite our political differences, to make sure the mission of the atheist movement is successful? Or are we going to instead prioritize our outside politics instead of that? It's a question I ask all of you. We also have a bunch of other goals that we need to achieve now in this new atheist movement that we're building. If certain groups don't want to work with us, we're going to create our own path. And we're going to move forward with those that want to work with us. I'm very proud of Atheist Alliance International. 
for being on that path with us and for having me on the advisory board and Atheists for Liberty as an affiliate. We need to make that second half of what Woody wanted possible and victorious. We need to make atheism cool again. There's a new religious right that has emerged. It's different than the old one, but we have to combat it with new tools and with a new understanding of what's going on. There's a religious and woke left that's also defending religious fundamentalism in the name of diversity. We need to combat them with the same amount of ferocity, the same amount of passion, and not let our partisanship get in the way. If we do this, if we don't repeat the same mistakes that our predecessors made just a few years ago, some of these same people that won't talk to you guys, and I know who some of you people are here in this call, we're going to win. And we're going to win in a way that we haven't even seen before. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. I'm proud to still be supportive of Atheist Alliance International for putting the bullshit behind them. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. And um, I th think we'll get a lot of comments uh, about, about uh, departing from that. The next uh, participant is my dear friend Nina Sankari. She is a Polish activist and advocate for secularism, women's rights and social justice. She has been a prominent figure in campaigns against discrimination and violence targeting, targeting women, working with organizations such as the Polish Women's Strike. Nina is dedicated to advancing gender equality and empowering marginalized communities. In 2018, she was recognized by the Gazeta Viborcha as one of the 50 bold women in 2018 who are changing the world for the better. And I know she is. She is also the editor-in-chief at the Treglat at the Ichni, Atheist Review in English, and co-founder and vice president of the foundation Kazimiera Lichinski. It's very hard to pronounce. Um, but um, she is a very dear friend. I've had the chance to join their activities her activities in uh, in Poland for many years, and have seen uh, her important work growing, and more and more people uh, siding with our principles. So I think it's very nice and very good to have her here with us today. Thank you, Nina. Now the floor is yours. We lost her. Fotis. Do we have Nina? I, I, I cannot see Nina. She used to be here, but. She was yeah, she was here. Yeah, I saw her. She left. Ah, she, she, she is entering the, 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 the meeting again. Ah, okay. She's joining now. Good. So, Nina, well, are you welcome, there? Welcome, Nina. You, you lost. Uh, the introduction from uh, Hugo, but uh, uh, the floor is yours now. But uh, you can unmute yourself, please. Yes, I said very nasty things about you, Nina. But anyway, try now. <laughs> unmute yourself. Un. You. Yes, 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 I'm trying. Is it okay now? Okay. Have you listened yeah. to me, Huga? Or I can I hear you. Start? I can hear you. Could you hear me? Can you? Now we can hear you. Please go on. Okay. We hear you. Shall I start with presentation or you already done it? Huga. Yes, I presented you. It's your time. The floor is yours. Sorry. I'm really sorry. I had to fuck up with my laptop. I'm sorry. But I'm back. <laughs> so good afternoon or maybe good morning. I don't know. Uh, fellow atheists and happy atheist day to everybody. Um, I don't know if uh, Hugo spoke about the, uh, our atheist review. 
Have you talked about it, Huga? That I am a chief editor. I, the it is, I mentioned it. I mentioned oh, it's it. that it is that, and uh, okay. So let's uh, let's start. Uh, have you mentioned also our Eddie's Days event? No. No. So I think it's important to do so. So I am one of the main organizers of the event uh, 80s Days in Warsaw. Some of you already uh, participated in it. For example, uh, David Silverman, for example, you, Hugo, many times. And I don't know, David Rantz should be somewhere there. He also uh, participated in it. And you are all cordially invited to the next uh, these days events. Uh, last year, it was a big event um, run under the slogan um, uh, Science Not Delusions and uh, with participations of uh, Richard, Professor Richard Dawkins, who also received our uh, 80th of all time award. Uh, however, every uh, year we also this, uh, offer uh, the 80s of the year award and David Silverman, David Rand already received it. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, maybe I will mention also some of our biggest campaigns because it will also show what are those ways uh, of working to achieve some uh, goals? Uh, our uh, at least, um, um, agenda. So I would like to mention uh, the biggest one only, like stop blasphemy laws, atheism set us free. You can see it maybe on here. Um, baby shoes remember war, so it's against pedophilia in the church, uh, followed by 90 cities in uh, Poland. Um, uh, homophobia kills, you don't need to hate. And the last campaign, it was uh, humanist atheists across borders for Ukraine. Um, we are also co-founders uh, as uh, Kazimierz Ruszyński Foundation. We are also a co-founder of the Polish Women's Strike. It's, uh, I, I hope some of you uh, heard about it, the very big feminist movement in Poland. Uh, and I think this movement actually changed the, um, the, the uh, government last year. This movement, women and uh, youth, um, I hope, I, I think so, changed uh, and, uh, the, the, the government last uh, autumn. Um, and the minimum minimum, probably you uh, did not say about it uh, any word. Uh, I would like to say about uh, Kazimierz Wyszczyński, uh, after whom our foundation, Kazimierz Wyszczyński, uh, was named, who was the um, very big thinker, at first openly atheist philosopher of the 17th century. And we are very proud of him. And we consider ourselves uh, his hers. In the 17th century, he wrote, he asserted in his uh, uh, um, The Non Existentia Dei treatise that uh, the God, uh, the, the man was not created by uh, God, but in the contrary, uh, man uh, is a creator of God who is uh, just, um, who doesn't exist in real. Um, is not a real um, being, but uh, exists just uh, in mind of people. And also that people uh, uh, are being deceived uh, with this invention of God uh, to oppress them. So I think it sounds uh, quite uh, modern. 
and it was in 17th century. He was uh, tortured and cruelly tortured. His uh, blasphemous tongue, his blasphemous hand cut, and uh, finally his uh, head also, he was decapitated and burned uh, at the uh, Market Square of Warsaw. And uh, to commemorate him, we organize every year the Atheist Days in Warsaw. Um, now, right to the topic. And uh, um, I would like to share with you an experience that many Poles, including me, uh, myself, and people from Eastern Europe countries had had, and maybe some conclusion uh, that we can uh, can be drawn uh, from it. Uh, um, we are, I will start maybe with announcing some conclusions already now out of fear that later on maybe I will not have enough time. The topic of our panel is about normalizing atheism. Uh, but in fact, our Polish experience shows that in, it requires previous denormalization of religions. Uh, like the, the, normal, the normalization of smoking. I don't mean by that that we have to ban uh, religions uh, as such, but in public space, yes. Like smoking, I'm sorry, David, <laughs> Dave. And uh, uh, we need to convince, I hope, I think that we need to convince the society that smoking uh, is less harmful than religions. So we have to be able to deliver this message to the society because religions uh, are uh, harmful uh, in uh, cognitive, ethical, and social areas. So it is probably the most imp important message that we can start with. Uh, also, um, very briefly, uh, what I think uh, could, should be the part of this denormalization of religions is that religions are incompatible with democracy. Full stop, we have to deliver this message to the society. Religion are not compatible with democracy. And less religions uh, interfere in the affairs of state, the better it is for the citizens. Another also uh, uh, conclusion after this uh, experience, experience that I will be talking later on uh, is that uh, secularism uh, understood as uh, uh, for example, uh, French model of separation of church and state, separation and guarantees of um, uh, free, uh, conscious free, uh, yes, of free conscious is not enough. Our experience is showing is clearly secularism is based on the political model of separation of. Uh, church and state. And if we have uh, the left wing or very enlightened liberals uh, in power, it works. But when it is the right uh, and uh, especially um, religious right uh, in power, it doesn't work. Even if you have all the, uh, the laws uh, um, inscribed in the um, constitution or other codes. And one, so in my opinion, uh, what we need uh, to this concept to be effective is the atheization of the society where we atheists are majority, then the secularism is uh, working. Uh, and maybe again, one of those uh, conclusions is that um, uh, 
that we absolutely have to oppose the special status of religious institution, institutions and uh, especially founding of them, but in general, religious institutions should have the same status as uh, all other NGOs and that uh, for in in my opinion, in our opinion, in our foundation, that is uh, our goal. Then also uh, maybe one um, thought about fundamentalism, because even in our atheist, um, atheist society, uh, we often accept religions in the society and are very critical uh, of fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism only. I think it is uh, an error. And uh, I, I can quote here um, from my memory, uh, Taslima Nasrin, who said what uh, the fundamentalism is to religion, what stems are to roots. You can cut off the stems, but if there are roots left, then the stems will grow back from them. And we saw it very, very clearly uh, in Poland and the countries of the region. And now I would like to say some words about how it happened in this uh, region. Uh, so I'm from Poland, a country that still about 30 years ago was a part of so-called communist camp and was officially uh, the fully secular state. And now, more than 30 years later, uh, we live in a real confessional state. And it was the price to be paid to the Catholic Church for its uh, undeniable contribution in the overthrowing the so-called communist regime. The bill was and continued to be paid in currency called human rights. First women uh, rights, then LGBT rights, atheist rights as well. Under the dictate of the Polish Conference of Bishops, the principles of separation of church and state and of secularism were erased from the Polish constitution. Bishops did not agree on neutrality of state neither, introducing the bizarre principle of the mutual autonomy. In short, the sovereignty of Poland was reduced to the autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Vatican. The alliance of the throne and the altar has been medieval alliance, has been restored uh, restored and um, Poland has been crucified from the parliament. We have a big cross, uh, the um, uh, parliament uh, hall of debates and uh, to the from the this, uh, this place to the kindergarten uh, public schools uh, are converted to catholic madrasa where uh, we have more of lessons of catechism of religion than of uh, chemistry physics and uh, biology altogether uh, also, um, the freedom of scientific research was restricted. Artists, artists had their mouth gagged. Doctors and teachers encouraged to recognize the supremacy of the divine law over the state law. Uh, lawyers relying on the canon law uh, and giving judgment uh, based on it. Uh, pri uh, priests being above the law and deputies praying for rain or smelling the stench of Satan while listening to the project bill of secular school. It's my personal experience. I was there in the parliamentary hall as support for the rapporteur of the bill. Uh, so it can sound uh, like satiric uh, image, but I'm sorry to say it was, it still remain our reality. Uh, I, I will add uh, more to that. The, the law and justice government pushed the destruction further, eliminating the balance of legislative, executive and judiciary powers. 
destroying the constitutional and Supreme Courts. Women have been treated as third class citizens after men and fetuses, deprived of their rights, especially of their bodily autonomy, forced to give birth to unviable children for the sake of baptizing them, or dying from septicemia after refusal of therapeutic abortion. LGBT people have been treated as Jews under the Nazi regime, where the authorities uh, expressed the will to clean Poland from LGBT. 30 municipalities declared their uh, free LGBT zones and uh, the peaceful equality march organized by LGBT in Białystok faced a real pogrom incited by the church, by the same Archbishop Wojda, who last week has been appointed the president of the Conference of Bishops. We, the Atis, have been treated as Bolsheviks, traitors of Poland, the only good uh, Paul is a good Catholic, and uh, have been proposed to, to go to Belarus if you want to remain uh, uh, atheist. It, it happened uh, some years ago. It was the proposal of the deputy of um, the uh, Law and Justice uh, Party. Uh, so what began uh, with the depriving women of their fundamental rights ended up with the destruction of democracy, of civil liberties and human rights for all. Luckily, last October, the democratic opposition won the parliamentary elections, and now we are in process of restoring democracy. It happened, it happened exactly because the women deprived of their rights and used youth fed up with the, this clerical and democratic regime <clears throat> and uh, at the last moment saved Poland from the Gilad, Gilad of handmade uh, tales, uh, imposing already its rule in Poland. But uh, such a massive cler uh, cler clericalization of, uh, po of Poland uh, evoked um, uh, the, the reaction and already a year ago, Poland uh, became a, a leader, a global leader in living church, in living religion as well. However, uh, what uh, con uh, concerns the youth they are really massively living church, and there are now schools where uh, nobody, uh, nobody um, uh, goes to the lessons of religion, the class of religion. Uh, but the problem is that this this uh, youth. Uh, it's living religion, but it doesn't mean that they are joining us, it is, and it doesn't mean that they become uh, active, because for them, being in Europe, uh, and uh, it, it, it means for them that it is not that uh, important, they just can leave and that's all, but in fact, we still face uh, this, uh, are facing the religious oppression of the church, and for example, even after the change uh, of the government to the liberal one in October, uh, after the October elections, uh, the liberalization of abortion, the project bill, still was not even proposed uh, for vote. There are uh, four projects uh, different in different of different um, extent uh, of liberalization, and uh, neither of them uh, still was uh, proposed for uh, votes. So, <coughs> um, what I uh, would like to say uh, about uh, our um, atheist community, even if the environment in Poland is not very friendly, still not very friendly for atheists, uh, I would say that uh, this, uh, this uh, history 
of full secularism under the so-called communist regime make uh, uh, the situation complicated because from one hand, uh, it was very, um, very uncomfortable to uh, be openly atheist in Poland because of this uh, association with Bolsheviks, communists, traitors to uh, etc. etc. This uh, that's why we cherished very much our atheist philosopher of 17th century because it uh, proved that uh, atheism was not uh, brought by on the bayonets of the Red Army. We have a tradition of atheism in Poland. It's on uh, one hand. On another hand, uh, the youth uh, doesn't remember already all those problems. It is not a it's irre irrelevant for them. Communism means for them, freedom from religion uh, is uh, um, like something uh, natural, and they just uh, claim to not to be forced to do that or whatever else uh, as well. Um, I think that. For this part, I already took all my time, maybe even more yeah. <laughs> of it, so I don't no, okay. take more. Uh, and I think that maybe more we can discuss uh, during the question and answers um, session. That was very interesting, Nina. Very interesting, especially because uh, Poland and Hungary are the, the two bad guys inside the European Union. And, uh, no, 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 we are now a good guy. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. Good guy. Changing into changing for the good, changing yes. for the good. So yes. it, it's good. So news. we thank you so, so much. we hope for better for yeah. secularism <laughs> and atheism as well. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, now the our last speaker is our dear friend uh, Lorenz Krauss. He's a renowned theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author, celebrated for his contributions to understanding the universe's fundamental workings. His research spans topics like particle physics, cosmology, and quantum mechanics. Krauss authored best-selling books, including The Physics of Star Trek and A Universe from Nothing, elucidating complex scientific concepts for a wide, wider audience. He's a passionate advocate for science, literacy, and secularism, like our uh, dear <clears throat> and remembered Carl Sagan. Um, he is uh, engaged uh, in public discourse on controversial topics. Uh, Krause's uh, captivating lectures and media appearances have made him a leading figure in popularizing science, inspiring countless individuals to delve into the wonders of the cosmos. And we are all very proud to have Lawrence here with us today. Thank you very much, Lawrence. The floor is yours. Well, thanks for that kind and overly long introduction. I appreciate it. In any case, um, uh, I, I've been listening to the discussion um, and I think I, I was trying to, I knew I was last and I always like to be the devil's advocate wherever I am. And so I'm going to take that role here. Uh, I have a overarching sense of disappointment about atheism. That it was the situation with atheism in the world today. And, and particularly I hear from, I'm supposed to speak from the United States, although I'm actually in Canada right now, but it's not that different. Um, I, you know, Thomas mentioned the reason rally I had forgotten it's 10 years, but I guess if I think of things since the high of that reason rally, I I'm, I'm disappointed in the progress of situation. Um, in the United States, we have Mike Johnson, a fundamentalist head of the uh, uh, Speaker of the House, who, who's a liter a, literally a biblical literalist, who uh, before he became a uh, politician helped uh, law or before he became leader helped lobby to get the um, Creation Museum funded in, in, uh, in Tennessee, in, in Kentucky. Um, he wants to criminalize homosexuality, recriminalize it, and um, obviously criminalize abortion. 
he he said that the separation of church and state is so the the state will stop incursion into religion rather than otherwise rather than the other way around. It's, it's hard to know if his opposition to to anthropogenic uh, climate change is is related to his belief that humans are are um you know have been given domain over the earth, and it's also hard to know whether what his views are in the on the current war in, in Gaza whether it's whether he's he's thinking of apocalyptic myths of revelation so there's that there's the uh court in alabama which has declared embryos as people um a few cells uh are now people uh obviously for religious reasons we have on the supreme court uh a bunch of people including one incredibly crazy christian um uh amy conan barrett who, who's a, who's who's a member of a really kind of um weird catholic sect um and then, as as uh, Tony pointed out, we also have evan evangelists who are remarkably um, strongly pushing Donald Trump, who I think is likely to win the next presidential election in, in the United States. Um, and so, I don't think the situation in the United States is particularly. Um, um, I'm not optimistic about it in in the context of almost anything, but but also in the context of the of the um, the incursion of of religion into into politics and into into public policy. On the other hand, uh, atheists are not shielded against religious dogma. Well, at least dogma that's similar to religion. We have seen uh, secularism. In many cases, in 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 the West, devolve into a kind of religion. We see things like anti-racism and critical race theory becoming, um, uh, it, it, well, being in, indoctrinated certainly in in universities and in government throughout the throughout the the West, where where certain ideas are not allowed to be debated. Ideas like the question of whether there's systemic racism and sexism everywhere. Um, and, the, and the claim, of course, of, of anti-racism is that unless you recognize you're racist, then you're racist. It's very, it reminds me a lot of what used to be the test of whether you were a witch in the, in the Middle Ages. If you, if you uh, more or less denied you were a witch, you were a witch. And if you didn't deny you were a witch, you were a witch. Um, we see that coming in everywhere with identity politics being being displayed. We see the fact that that there can't be we see public officials making claims which are ridiculous, like Francis Collins when he was head of the National Institutes of Health saying that NAH was an inherently um, uh, racist organization, which he obviously doesn't believe because if he did, he would have resigned uh, when he was director. We see that you can't have any discussions at universities about a variety of things. You, you're not allowed to bring up the question of whether there are, whether sex and gender are different and the fact that there are sex is binary and gender may not. That alone is enough to get you canceled. Just asking that question. Um, so the whole, you're seeing people removed for asking questions, very typical of fundamentalist religion. Um, and in fact, I, I coined the term fundamentalist wokeism because, you know, woke has this sort of character that I don't think is necessarily bad. It was intended to to try and address inequalities in society, I think. But then woke fundamentalism is to is to sort of wokeism as as religious fundamentalism is to religion. And and generally the it's religious fundamentalism that one is trying to to most concerned about. We're seeing um people excluded um on the basis of merit all all sorts of things that there are secular groups that are that are uh, promoting this kind of dogma and 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 this unquestioning dogma, when in fact policy should always be based on empirical evidence. And one can ask the question: Is there systemic racism here? Is there are is sex binary? One should be able to ask those those questions. And um, and one seeing uh, at all levels of institutions this kind of. Um, Secular religion being coming in, and you know, I was at a, I, I, I had a, I, I was on the debate at the uh, Oxford Union on the question is everyone religious a few years ago, and I chose to take the side yes against several of my atheist colleagues because I do think people tend to want to believe, and the idea to want to believe 
is not just to want to believe in God, but want to believe in other in other um, uh, uh, fantasies that one finds exciting. Another thing that's associated with with secular religion right now is the notion that somehow indigenous cultures have special rights that others don't, and that indigenous knowledge is somehow special. Elizabeth White, an anthropologist, has been canceled numerous times for pointing out that in anthropological meetings now, people accept indigenous creationism where they wouldn't have accepted Christian creationism. That uh, that ridiculous ideas about the world being nine thousand years old or less. Uh, that and 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 that that indigenous culture is coming from some godlike figure, or whether it's an animal or, or otherwise. That somehow that's knowledge that has to be appreciated as anything but nonsense. And again, faculty have been uh, cancelled and removed from their positions at universities for asking whether indigenous knowledge should be taught in astronomy classes. Um, uh, if it's essential to if it's essential to the understanding of astronomy. So I, I see. I see traditional religions and incursions in the in the West, in the United States in particular. I see this secular fundamentalism um, incursion, and and um, uh, you know, and so that means you have you have incursions from both the left and the right, as I think Thomas was trying to address. Um, you also have this growing sense of anti-science, largely due to the way I think COVID was mishandled. Um, it was a great chance for people to learn about how science at the forefront is uncertain and tentative, and we have to learn from evidence, and we can't make definitive statements uh, when there's not enough evidence. It was a great chance to do that. I think that was blown, and, and people kept saying, uh, follow the science when it wasn't clear what it was, and you find the public, um, generally one of the reactions, I think, is a distrust, for the first time since I've been a scientist, a kind of general distrust of science. Of course, Religious fundamentalists and creationists have always distrusted science because, of course, science is inconsistent with religious fundamentalism. But it's sad when you see that kind of distrust coming uh, from other sectors of the uh, of the world. And and finally, um, and we we heard a talk from one of our colleagues from from um, from Israel. But of course, what's going on in the Middle East is a you know a bit of desert that has been accorded religious standing and. And in which you see the same kind of craziness. I mean, I want to go back to my late friend Christopher Hitchens, who, who argued that you know, I mean, of course, he as I am a supporter of Israel's right to exist because it exists. And it, but this notion of somehow uh, divine right to land that comes from both from all sides is just completely ludicrous. And it and it's caught and that notion of an entrenched um, right to land or or even a historical um, precedence for for right to land, which we see in indigenous cultures around the world, in the, in the, well, at least in the West, in this reverence of indigenous cultures, and um, and we see in 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 Israel and 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 uh, in the Gaza and other places, people's somehow notion about what happened two thousand years ago or fifteen hundred years ago or even even ninety years ago matters to what's happening today instead of the reality that these countries exist. That people live in them, and uh, and we have to function based on reality. So I guess uh, I'm just going to. I'm sorry to end this this long um, series of dialogues with a a sense of uh, disappointment. But I thought I'd at least raise that while we're while we're celebrating. It's worth while realizing that that um, it's fine to celebrate, and it's nice to recognize that um, that that. Um, um, the, the 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 right in in a number of places the right to ask the right to not believe is now being enshrined where it wasn't before but unfortunately in places like the United States um, there are large steps backwards that I have think we have to recognize and um, once again illustrate the point that um, that not believing in God is not um, does not insulate you from um, other other forms of mat of, of 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 mind viruses, and that the easiest pe person to fool is yourself, and that's why I, I I try and promote science so much because it helps train us to realize that we are we all want to believe in God and other things, but we all want to believe, and we need to constantly critically assess our own beliefs and be willing to listen to others, uh, and more most importantly to ask questions and celebrate. And so we need to do that because there are threats everywhere.
I guess that's all I'll say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, it's very challenging. And um, just a, a thought following that, uh, I think mm, all of us have lived uh, our youth during the Cold War times, and what we expected to follow the Cold War was something far different from what we are living today. I wonder if uh, we were not ready for this change or the world leaders who took over were the the worst ones to 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 take over after after the cold war some some stupid guy like uh, like uh, george bush being the us president and the the leader of the of the free world free united world was perhaps the worst man uh, in the in the time but anyway uh, it's just a reflection on this. I thank you all very much for this opening statements and for this uh, great picture of uh, the, the the situation in different parts of uh, of the world in our, in our our societies. And now we move into the um, question and answers uh, section. With the uh, I, I've seen there are many many questions around. I thank the the audience for putting them forward, and uh, I also ask our question panel to help us with uh, sorting them and and uh, and passing them on to the to the participants. So please, uh, David and uh, David <laughs> and Antonoy, our president, uh, please feel free to to start. To open the fire. Uh, I I have uh, I have copied down in some of the questions. Uh, um, uh, we, we I, have also we have also gathered some of them, uh, and uh, I, I'd like to let's say present them uh, by uh, you know uh, first uh, come first served. Uh, so there is one from uh, Mirei Hanna. Uh, the question goes, in the U.S., why can I openly talk about the nonsense of Christianity? However, a lot of us as atheists are afraid of talking about Islam, even though it's far more nonsensical. We are immediately called Islamophobics, hate speech. I feel as if we are losing freedom of speech in this aspect. Uh, does someone want to uh, to reply to this? I, I have a comment to to do, and if there is no other uh, uh, person wanting to to reply to this, I, I'd like to to make a small comment. Well, I'll, I'll jump in as I always do. Um, <laughs> often do. Um, I think. Uh, I think. Um, Unfortunately, it's the, the 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 once again, it's a question of politics coming in um, and interfering with open mindedness. Uh, I, I mentioned the 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 willingness to accept indigenous uh, creationism. And I think the one we tend to see, unfortunately, um, notions of um, uh, coming from the left that that conflate um, Political problems and political persecution that happens with uh, with religious craziness, and um, and uh, and so we tend to see exactly the fact that people are afraid to come out and say Islamic fundamentalism is completely nuts for two reasons. Obviously, there's a concern about violence, but I think more so there's a concern about people, well-meaning people, mostly liberals. I think well-meaning people who try to say, well, Muslims in this country shouldn't be discriminated against, but conflate that with the notion that that uh, um, that saying that the, what they believe is crazy is the same as saying that they're, uh, that those people should be discriminated. So unfortunately, I think it's it's a, con a conflation of politics and and uh, and and reason. Anyway, that's all I'll say. Um, may I comment? This is David. Yes, please. Uh, 
I wouldn't say that Islam is more nonsensical than Christianity. I think they're both totally nonsensical, but Islam is more aggressive. This uh, preference for Islam, this privilege that's granted to Islam so that it can't be criticized, is rooted in uh, decolonial movement and the so-called anti-racist movement, whereas Islam is seen as the religion of the oppressed and Christianity as the religion of the bad Europeans. And so it's a it's a it's a it derives from a from a bad approach to anti-racism. Uh, Islam should be criticized just like every other religion. If I may, uh, there's, there's also uh, fear in in situations like in France, with the professor beheaded because of uh, of uh, asking questions about Islam or opposing. Or proposing uh, free thought, etc. Uh, those are events that uh, have a political and a social um, effect that uh, make people uh, act uh, with fear when it comes to to criticize uh, Islam or or Islamics, and, and they are labeled as Islamophobe, which I don't understand. What's wrong with uh, being Islamophobe as we are all religion folks? So uh, it's, it, it should be criticized as any ideology. Anyway, uh, it, I, I think the, the, the acts of violence are, are taking over with fear. And uh, that's also important to consider. Um, more questions, please? Hugo, may yes, I add something to you? Yes. Uh, you already... Uh... Yes, please. We're speaking about Europe, and that what that's what I wanted to stress. It's not only U.S. It's not uh, maybe even the the problem is bigger in Europe, and uh, I'm sorry to say it, uh, but uh, the left, in my opinion, is um, in a, in a sense. Uh, responsible for, for for this situation. And it is not only, I'm sorry to say it, it is not only because bad conscience of uh, anti-colonial, uh, about the colonial, uh, I'm sorry, um, First, yeah. history. Uh, there is also a question about uh, clientelism. Uh, the, the left wing and France, uh, for example, but not only, um, um, lost uh, some um, support, even financial support, from the uh, previous uh, communist countries and especially uh, Soviet Union. So their, their uh, fund uh, new uh, resources and new support. I'm not speaking uh, about specifically financial, but uh, more members uh, in um, this. Um, uh, that's right. That uh, discriminated sometimes. Discriminated uh, uh, immigrant um, uh, immigrant environment. So. I think it is not only one uh, factor, there are many, and unfortunately uh, for me, the left is uh, in big part responsible for the situation because uh, in this uh, anti-colonialist uh, politics and in the, the defense of the uh, oppressed uh, people from uh, Muslim countries, they also uh, f forget uh, to, that uh, um, uh, there are oppressed in this oppressed group, namely women. And uh, yes. there is now two, um, how to say, two measures to, um, to different uh, approaches uh, women's rights uh, in fact it turns 
to the different form of racism because uh, white women have the rights and the uh, women rights of Muslims women uh, are seen uh, are not um, are not uh, defended. Uh, the, uh, they, for example, hijab is seen as a sign of uh, independence from colonialism, white colonialism, and not uh, as subjugation, as oppression towards women. Yeah, I think that David has uh, extensively written about that and 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 worked about that. David Rand with the with the Wokes, and it's uh, it works on both sides of the of the Atlantic. In in Europe, we have this with with immigrants, and in 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 American countries, we have the same with the the native population. The the case of the recent proposal of the Chilean constitution or the Bolivian constitution with Evo Morales uh, stating different laws for different uh, uh, ethnic groups. It's something that is in this part considered as progressive, while in, 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 in other parts of the world would be exactly the opposite, would be the most conservative and, and, and divisive of, 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 uh, of society. And I think it's a, it's a good add point a you made. Yes, can please. I can I add a point to this? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I come from an Islamic background, and I find it very disturbing the notion put forward. Uh, oh, oh, the, oh fuck off! By the atheist, that it is because Islam is an idea, it is all right to criticize Islam, but the Muslims are people; they should not be criticized. And this is very, very disturbing. Islam is just an idea, powerless. What makes Islam powerful is those who practices it. And it is organized, the establishment, the progress we made against other religions such as Christianity, uh, not by you know, telling this is Christian doctrine, this is wrong. We actually challenge the church and the establishment. And Islam is the similar now, that Islamic establishment, the Muslims, making the establishment their people and they has to be challenged this is like you know if if you are telling people to practice these stupid ideas oppressive ideas those people has to be challenged and they have an identity that is muslim okay, this this is a very left-wing populist i am left-wing myself very left-wing uh, probably most of us are but this this is a very populist idea. It is those who practicing Islam, those who are making it fruit, uh, uh, violent, they have to be challenged. I I agree. Look, I'm going to have to leave in a minute, so I'm going to say three things, which may which as sure one of at least one of which is provocative. I agree with Tanoi exactly. But also to comment on David David Rand's very important point that inherently Islam is no more crazy than Christianity or Judaism or any of the other world religions. Um, I think that there is a fundamental difference that, um, which is one of the reasons that it's of concern, is that most Christians aren't really Christian, as Richard Dawkins pointed out in his foundation. Most Christians pick and choose the ideas that they like. They like to call themselves Christians because it makes them feel like they're good people, but they don't buy all the all the nonsense in the Old Testament or New Testament. They don't stone their children for disobeying, for example. But the difference is that Islam is a much newer religion. So in my opinion, it's much more like Christianity was in the 12th or 13th century, you know, it's six, 700, 800 years old. And 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 one saw that mm -hmm. Christianity in, in 12th, 13th century was just as ridiculous and and and, and violent. And because because the everything had to be taken exactly literally. So I think the difference is, and one of the concerns about Islam is that it's so, it's more central in this in the Islamic belief faith that you accept the Quran, every word of the Quran as being sacred and inviolable. Whereas most Christian, well, most Christians, as I say, haven't many of them probably haven't read the Bible, but they no one takes it seriously. 
They just take the ideas, you know, that they like. And so I think that's the fundamental difference between the two. Inherently, the theology is equally stupid, but the, but the, it's just a younger religion. One would hope if the world survives another 100 years that when and that will, one will find that Muslims are just as uh, un, uh, unbelieving as most of the people of the Church of England are in England. Um, the other thing I would just say is the real problem about religion, and I mean this in the sense of secular as well as theological religion, is the sense of a monopoly on morality. I think that's the real, the real problem. It's a sense that only those people who believe X are moral, and anyone who doesn't is immoral. And that's most religions, of course, have already got a monopoly on morality. But again, I see it in the same kind of intransigence, you know, political intransigence that I see. Whereas if you don't believe in X, um, then you're immoral, and that can be any kind of politics. And finally, the last thing I say, I saw Jessica say, and we talk about, and we just heard that women are marginalized nina said that i think it's true but i think it's unfair to say it's a universal thing i think it's in the, in the west i don't think it's true it's true it's true in 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 many countries around the world in africa and in and certainly in most muslim countries but i think it's uh i don't i think it's quite the opposite in 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 the west i don't think women are marginalized and i think to just uh say that outright uh, is demeaning of women as well as 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 uh, everyone else anyway that's a Hope I probably offended at least everyone here at once. So I think I've done my work and um, and um, I've got to go in about four minutes, but thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your provocative thoughts. More questions? Okay, there is another one. Uh... I wanted to make a point about uh, the Islamophobia thing, but we are going. We're never going to end. So let us uh, proceed. Uh, so there is uh, one from uh, DJ Dan Danatai. I think I pronounced it right. In one of the world's largest democracies, like India, Hindutva is now gaining ground. The new generation is newly immersed in superstition. Islamic fundamentalism is also rampant in India's two neighboring countries, Pakistan and Bangladesh. There is a risk that the lives of atheists in India, like those in Pakistan and Bangladesh, will be threatened if a Hindutva government is formed again in India. So what kind of role should international organizations play in this regard? Anybody wants to answer that? If it's okay, well, if it's okay, I'm from that uh, land. I could, I could uh, try. Please go on. Please, don't worry. There is a difficulty with India that Indian government now is so nationalistic and arrogant. It, it will not even take into consideration that some form of international criticism happening. It's very arrogant. And what's happening in India in the name of Hindutva, it's not just uh, religion, it's nationalism. They, in one hand, uh, they want to have a secular country. On the other hand, they want a strong country, and that is the basis of that strong country. They made it cultural that we are nationalistic, that the Hindutva in India, religion and nationalism are blend together now under this government. And there is a, there is a, it's it's a very complex situation because Indian, Indian, all these states, the Indian fabric is so fragile that India could break any time. And this Hindutva is holding India together. Right now in India, there is only one strong political party that has influence all over India, all over the provinces, all over the nationalities. That is this Hindu nationalist part, the Indian Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP. So it makes it BJP. complex that without BJP, probably India break. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very complex. And then 
you have Indian people has this sense of deprivation. Uh, okay, the, the thank uh, credit goes to our English friends that for 200 years of deprivation and colonialism, that uh, it, this, is, this, is, this is a narrative they are also uh, preaching, the Indian nationalists. Uh, because of 200 years of colonialism and oppression, we, once upon a time, the richest country in the world, 27% of world's GDP, they left us with 2% of world's GDP and one of the poorest countries in the, in the world. We are emerging back again and Hindutva is the essence of our national unity. Then uh, British also played a uh, very, very sad game, cool game there, the religious line. Uh, British made Hindus and Muslims kill each other there, literally kill each other, kill your neighbors at the very end of their reign. And that's a divide, division line. It still exists there. So it's it's very difficult in India. International pressure would not do anything in India. It has become arrogant as a country. So there is uh, not actually not much room there. Uh, Pakistan, very Islamic country. Islamists hold massive power there. Also, uh, Western countries always plays a very bad politics in P Pakistan. Right now we are seeing what the United States doing. There was an election. This election was outright corrupt and it happened with support of United States. United States are like United States played a crucial role in dismantling the democratically elected government recently and put a puppet government. And whenever United States plays this game in those countries, uh, religion is one of the element <coughs> yeah, yeah, America is using, always using. I come from Bangladesh and I know how America destroyed secularism of my country. And this is exactly what they're doing in Pakistan right now. And under our eyes, like, you know, in, in, in front of our eyes. It's sad. It's very sad for the United States of America. Like in 21st century, they're still doing it. They're still playing with religion. Learn nothing. And religion was a weapon during the, the Cold War times. Yeah, and but they're still doing it. It still is. It still is. It still is. It still is. Yeah. Pakistan it's serves as an example. Power. You just have to read the news of last one month and you'll see what they're doing right now. We have another question uh, from Michelle Williams. And I think this can be answered by two of our American participants. She says, how can we start to build spaces where we are represented in politics, where we meet the most resistance? And I think it was covered by 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 Tony and uh, or, uh, or other US participant, this, this uh, idea of uh, working together with, uh, with the like-minded people for secularism. Well, I don't I, know if you want to. I'll, I'll make a comment on that. So I, I think that that is happening, that the groups got together and they created the Secular Coalition in Politics in Washington, D.C. Actually, the Center for Inquiry opened up an Office of Public Policy at the same time as the Secular Coalition was forming. So we've been on the Hill. I spent four or five years lobbying uh, the Congress for secularism and atheism and, and uh, humanism. Um, but I don't understand how folks think that they cannot be involved in politics if they are worried about religion taking over our government and our lives. It's, that is where these policies are set, is they're set politically. So it's really important, as far as I'm concerned, to be involved politically to protect ourselves, our lives, and our families, and our values. And I'm done, thanks.
I'll actually jump on in as well. Um, Tony, I think what you said is very eloquent and amazing, and I totally agree with everything you just said. Um, but we we can definitely as well build on to the current successes we've made uh, too. So um, depending on if you as an individual were involved in politics on a wide variety of other issues, while I'm not an advocate of, of atheist organizations embracing too many outside issues that divide us in the talk I gave earlier here, um, a lot of us have our own interests and we're naturally going to be involved in other causes in other events. If there are any discussions around religion at said events, it's very important if you can be out as an atheist to be out as an atheist, to normalize being an atheist in these various different communities. We had 20 years to do it on the left. We're starting to now do it on the right. Um, I've gone to local progressive meetup groups back in the day when I was more left-wing affiliated, and I've gone to even young Republican events now that I'm more right-wing affiliated. And each and every time I expressed my skepticism, I expressed my love for secular government, my humanism, and my atheist advocacy. And one-on-one, -on -one, each of you will start to notice that you'll make one or two friends. Oh, I'm an atheist too. I'm an atheist as well. And eventually, if there's a certain area of your demographic that doesn't really have much secular activism, you, hypothetical person who I'm speaking to, people, you can then take the initiative to create that secular caucus, that secular element in that space. And that's how we were able to you know, be incredibly successful on the Hill with CFI's office and SCA's office, literally having a presence there, the Free Thought Caucus, the emergence of so many groups online and offline. We have 50% more of the work to do. It's going to take another 20 years to do the same for all of America. I'm, again, only speaking on behalf of the United States here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it's very important. And yes, you can't really separate um, politics uh, entirely from this kind of advocacy. Um, we can measure what, how much politics should be or not be involved, but it's all political. I think that what's really important, and let me just say this, Hugo, is that we speak out wherever we are, that we identify who we are and uh, what we believe in, because it gives permission for others then to speak out. And that's what we need. When we were knocking on doors in D.C., elected officials were so, some of them, and many more than you would expect, were so relieved to hear us saying out loud that we believe that religion does not belong in politics, that uh, we're opposed to religion. They are happy and relieved to know that there's a group that will support them if they take a stand. So mm -hmm. I think the most important takeaway from this meeting and any other one we have is that it's really important to stand up, speak out, to take action for what you believe in. Thank, thank you. Oh, 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 thank you, you so much for answering um, my question. Yeah, sorry, I, I think she, they made a very interesting point in terms of uh, the political action. And I think uh, this has to be hand in hand with, um, with the social action and with uh, uh, involving uh, citizens in 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 participating with uh, with our groups and, and uh, promoting our ideas, and I think John Richards made made a good point about it, and and he has been very successful at, at doing this with uh, with the resources we have from the internet and YouTube and uh, and, and lobbying, uh, um, and not lobbying, but working at at the at the social level. Uh, I would like your opinion if if. Uh, if you are around, John, please, uh, on this. How how do we attract more atheists to or and, and secularists to gather to to gain strength, especially young ones? I don't know if this is just an open question, know? but I I can help answer that if uh, if it's if it's open to everybody, uh, being a a. Yeah. Token young person. Yes. Um, one of the issues that I've noticed, and I've been in online and in-person atheist advocacy for the last 10 years, we've been through a lot of various different social cultural movements. Um, atheism was very, very sexy on the internet 10 years ago. So like 2012, 2013, 2014, everybody was jumping onto every single atheist stream and podcast. You would have YouTubers blowing up. Atheist content was the exact thing to talk about. That's kind of died actually recently when it comes to certain things. The, 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 the counterculture of atheism is actually not as 
um, hip online as it was in 2014. Um, so what we have to do is we have to adapt to the current times. Um, one thing that I, one thing that we're working on at Atheists for Liberty, for instance, is an upcoming college tour. We've been trying to, you know, work on it here and there over the course of the last year. And we're finally getting some momentum when it comes to the planning, um, because atheism was very prevalent on college campuses 10 years ago, secular student Alliance, having a ton of different chapters around the country. I would argue that's due to some of the outside politics, that momentum has kind of died down. And somebody was talking about my affiliation with like Turning Point USA in the past. What ended up replacing the hype of atheism on campuses was this idea of free speech on campuses. So we have to find ways, if there's a certain issue that is really, really, really attracting young people, anything that's controversial, anything especially that religion can be involved in, we have to make, we have to get atheism involved in that particular niche. Um, podcasting is really popular. Streaming is very popular. X spaces is really popular. Um, discussions on some of the most edgiest topics you can think of are very popular. If we can center religion and atheism into those topics and try to come at it from a fiery perspective, we were, we were very militant 10 years ago. I think we need to bring some of that in as well. You'll get the Gen Zers. You'll get the late millennials coming more into the fold. You know, uh, I, I think a lot of us are operating off the, the legacy of our past success from 10 years ago when we had that last bit of Internet hype. But that's kind of dwindled down a little bit. We have to figure out how to pivot and how to adapt quickly. And once we do, then we'll get more young people on board. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Mm, Nina, I think you were, you were, you wanted to say something about this? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Hi, can you hear me? Otis? Hello? Yes, Michelle, uh, please. Oh, oh, hi. Yes, Sorry, yes, I, I thought you could hear me. My apologies. I was like, is my thing working? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I, I wanted to add, uh, the reason why I asked that question, it's just like a commentary before I ask the question, is that I'm a, mostly part of the political right, and a part of the political right is kind of like- I'm so um, sorry, Michelle. You're speaking and we can't see you. So it's it's really odd. Could you put on your video, please? Um, I think I, hold on. I think I, I blocked my um, uh, the camera. camera. I'm not too sure if I did. All right, well then um, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so for right now. Um, so being a part of like the so-called political right, um, if you say like you're an atheist or you're a skeptic or you're a humanist, you're kind of like just basically saying blasphemy um, <laughs> out there. Like, how dare you say you're, um, you're a skeptic or you're an atheist. And um, that's why I ask that because it's so incredibly difficult to kind of normalize that sort of perspective in that in that realm because you 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 can kind of think okay well atheism is normalized in 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 the left but it's not so much um like um i wouldn't say popular but it's not as recognized as in you know the political right um but my next question um is that how do you go about this argument kind of like this you know argument of oh well how do you explain yourself as an atheist or a skeptic and in, in, in relation to morality like how you go about having a particular position on let's just say like abortion or something along those lines and say well oh i don't have to be someone who believes in god but have like a moral point of view you know i would just go right back to pointing out uh what the uh priests do in the catholic church what uh, the authorities do in the Southern Baptist Church. They rape, they sexually assault, they use their religion to, um, to cover up their criminal activity. And so if you were gonna talk about morality, they, the Christian religion and the Catholic religion uh, and the Muslim religion, all of the religions, are not moralistic. And even the word moral is like, so what? I, I don't think that we should be using that word moral. It is just so subjective and it's used to beat people down. I could go on forever, so I will stop. Thank you for the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I think we should 
stress that uh, morality or religion or your ethical point of view is something that is personal and it, it's it's a part of the of the oh, very yeah, it's a problem the way we live our, our morality or 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 our, our ethical framework what we ask from politicians is to act ethically and and, and whatever their, their beliefs are they don't have to steal public money they have to respect freedom they have to to ensure that we live in an in in an open society, they have to they have to make to create the environment for for this open society to to work and to be as plural and as inclusive as possible and to care for for those who have less, and uh, well that's what that's the kind of ethics or of morality we as citizen have citizens you know, want from from our uh, so-called leaders, but uh, the rest is not not up to the state or the government to decide w which is the moral framework for the citizens to to have. Uh, that's that's the, the the backbone of secularism is is freedom in the end is is absolute freedom of of, uh, of for for each of us. So thank you, thank you very much. They are asking me to wrap up and uh, I think it was a, a very, very good uh, meeting. I, I thank very much all of the participants, those who spoke, those who put uh, forward the questions and uh, those who were listening. And uh, we invite you to follow uh, the, the activities of Atheist Alliance International, I think. Uh, it's important to to get together, to join, to 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 participate, to uh, form more groups, uh, to to join our our organization and uh, any secular organization around, uh, and, and try to 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 group and uh, to be to to gain the strength we we definitely need in order to to gain the freedom and the equality for those of us who uh, think out of the box and, uh, and, and are proud of our critical thinking and uh, want more people to be critical and, uh, and respectful of others, of course. So uh, I, I thank um, AAI for uh, giving us a chance um, to, to have this webinar. Uh, again, all participants and I hope we we meet again sooner than later for another another chance like like this one. Uh, I do, I don't want to close this uh, without uh, mentioning uh, our uh, uh, sadness. The 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 sadness all and uh, our sympathy to to the victims of that criminal attack. It's really, uh, we are living in hard times and um, there are so many people suffering today and being killed. And so we hope that uh, from our, our worldview, we can uh, help building a, a better, more peaceful and tolerant world. So, Thanks, everybody, for, for being here today. And uh, our phone side, I don't know if you want to close. Yes. Thank you so much, Hugo. Thanks, everyone, for joining Atheist Alliance International uh, Atheist Day we webinar. Uh, it's been amazing. We've had amazing speakers, a lot of contrasting and polarizing opinions. I think that's the nature of uh, having these conversations. Um, and yeah, I think the, the one thing that unites us is the non-belief in God, but then there's a, a wide variety of, um, of ideologies and philosophies that we all follow. Um, so a little bit of patience with each other. I don't know how many of us are uh, acquainted with a street epistemology. I think it's a great tool that I use myself to have conversations with people who disagree with me. The Socratic method um, is a great way to, to converse rather than assuming we know about others. Um, I've had this um, philosophy for a while because I, I run a, a clubhouse um, house that's the largest atheist house. And uh, 
it's so useful to not ask the person what they believe, where they stand, but rather ask questions about who they are. And that, that really draws us together and allows us to um, create, you know, this bridge that is so almost, you know, close to impossible with religious people, especially. And I want to encourage everyone again to support Atheist Alliance International. Our website is uh, atheistalliancenternational.org. Um, you just Google us and you'll find uh, our website and you'll find our social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Um, and soon uh, we're going to do some rooms to promote us on Clubhouse as well. We, we are also on Threads. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're also on Threads. We're, I think, covering almost all of social media. Um, so please support us, support all, all, all the people here in our panel. If, if you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, supporting the, the cause of women, the cause of uh, atheists and secularists and people who are struggling with uh, blasphemy laws, we're doing lots of work to support uh, people in the Mi Middle East and Africa who are being persecuted. Um, I am personally in touch with someone who just fled Mauritania. Um, he's in, in South America trying to find refuge somewhere. So there's thousands upon thousands of, of uh, apostates, unbelievers who need support um, for just saying that they don't believe or, or, or even, even if they might believe for being uh, divergent, such as uh, LGBTQI and such. So um, yeah, I encourage anyone to support us and support the efforts we're doing. Um, we're not here to attack or uh, or do any harm to people. We're trying to defend our own rights and the rights of the people who are similar to us. And, and so for that, thank you all. Thank you to our amazing speakers. And thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, this has been Atheist Day, Atheist uh, Alliance International Webinar. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, I actually have a suggestion for anyone who wants to help a blasphemy case. Uh, sorry, tonight, sorry, we were done. Thank you. You can you can write to us Thank on you. our we email if you wish. Um, Please. Anyone uh, ben, 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 just get in touch with me. Yes. Okay. Be, uh, be, after the meeting, just send me a text, Ben. Well, thanks, everyone. We're going to wrap up now. And